life in man may be understood as the evolution of constraints upon the primeval chaos. That's what the paper starts with, and then it explores the consequences of its findings for our understanding of the human experience of time. And after I finished, if there's enough time left, whatever time may be, uh, I'd like to say some things about complexity because it's a question that came up during the very or in consequence of the dynamic introduction we heard from the president of ISST. Causal relations, by the way, uh, if you can't hear me, uh, say so. And if I can't hear you, then I'll be talking louder. <laughs> Causal relations are constraints that govern the manner in which events may be connected. The first section of this paper traces the steps in the evolution of causation as constraint and identifies the corresponding stages in the evolution of time. We begin at the beginning. A contemporary understanding associates the oldest form of causation with the origin of the universe that is with a very big bang of a very small and very hot dot. That dot was small enough to have passed through a contemporary atom, yet its mass is believed to have been the same as that of the universe today, which is a hefty 10 to the 54 grams, that's very heavy, at a temperature of 10 to the 32 degrees centigrade, although at that amount of heat it could be Fahrenheit, it doesn't matter, it's just pretty large. Uh, this very unusual object fits physical cosmology no less than the mystical visions of William Blake, who reminded us that all deities reside in the human breast. I propose to think of that massive hot dot as an object of absolute chaos, of pure becoming, in which time, space, electromagnetism, and gravity were merged into what John Wheeler called quantum form. That dot, the dot cosmos, is an idea to which we assign past reality because it fits our current model of the universe. And for reasons that to be given later, I postulate that the uh, constitutive features of this thought object, specifically its state of pure becoming, remains the permanent substratum of the universe. In other words, pure becoming works beneath or in all natural phenomena and serves as the primeval pool of potentialities. I imagine it has, uh, I imagine it as the state of the universe before 10 to the minus 45 seconds, and it's a very short period, after the theoretical zero point of time. The very short period is known as Planck time. I postulate that the primeval chaos is filtered through all processes taking different forms in the worlds of matter, life, and man. It is the unpredictable, the creative element in nature. In it, it is creative whether it leads to changes judged constructive or destructive from the human point of view. The absolute chaos I'm talking about must be distinguished from the chaos of chaos theory. Namely, the glory of chaos theory is that it can show how a deterministic, totally ordered and predictable system can give rise to totally unpredictable conditions. But the dot universe was not preceded by a world of any form of causation or causations, 
that were then followed by a deterioration of order. The history of the cosmos has been along the opposite direction. It began with pure becoming or absolute chaos, out of which it evolved increasingly more complex form, forms of permanence or being. Only this awesome drama be approached through the methods of physics and described in its language. First, it is necessary to agree that speaking of the temporal locations of events so close to cosmogenesis makes sense, as is the use of units of time we know from those of Mother Earth, years, days, hours, minutes, seconds. The way to look at these microscopic periods of periods of time is to acknowledge that they are artifices which permit us to accommodate within our noetic reality conditions that are knowable only through abstract reasoning and that are unmeasurable but not uncalculable. Once these preconditions are accepted, one may uh, enter and admire phys physical cosmogenesis. That process is divided into periods for which different laws of nature apply. Thus, quantum cosmology is appropriate for the cosmos before the end of the Planck period that I mentioned, that is, from about 10 to minus 45 seconds to about 10 to minus 11 seconds after the the theoretical zero point of time. Between 10 to the minus 11 seconds and about one hundredth of a second, particle cosmogony was, excuse me, thereafter standard physical cosmology is employed. Beginning perhaps 10 to the minus 35 seconds after the imagined zero point, the universe became populated by objects we know as elementary particles. I prefer to call them particle waves. There's a dash between them, particle dash waves. They formed distinct families such that each member of any of the families was indistinguishably identical to all other particle waves of its own kind. The only way the behavior of sets of identical objects may be described is statistical, that is, probabilistically. probabilistically. It follows that the earliest, the most primitive constraints about the manner in which events could be connected had, had to be probabilistic causation. Einstein could never accept the probabilistic nature of causation in the atomic world, a view expressed by his often quoted but hard to verify uh, utterance that God does not play dice with the world. I have no way knowing whether God does or does not play dice. But quantum theory demonstrates that nature certainly does. In the evolution of causation, whose steps I am attempting to trace, probability is the oldest and most primitive form of uh, constraint applied to the primeval chaos. It is not, it is the only form of causation in the quantum world and remained one of the forms of causations as, uh, of uh, constraints as causations in all later more complex integrative levels to wit those of solid matter, life, human minding and human society. One may say that probability remained the surviving ancestor of all later causal connectedness. When the expansion and therefore cooling of the universe, uh, immense collections of elementary objects froze out and gathered into the early galaxies. There, true to the law of large numbers formulated by the Swiss mathematician Jacob Bernoulli, probably became certainty. The probabilistic relationships of the particular world 
thus gave rise to deterministic causation of ponderable matter. The new form of causation did not replace its probabilistic ancestry, but was added to it as a new constraint. New constraint. Now, there were two constraints upon the ever-present primeval chaos. And because of the nested hierarchical organization of nature, there may be no deterministic connections among events without the presence of probabilistic causation as well. So 12.5 billion years ago, when we traveled along this path with uh, uh, Paul's lecture, uh, after the Big Bang, not the lecture was after the Big Bang, I mean 12 and a half million years <laughs> after the Big Bang, uh, the hot dot, which then has become a very cold immensity, gave rise to a yet newer way of connecting causes with their effects. It was organic intentionality, a hallmark of the life process. How did life and organic intentionality come about? There are good reasons to believe that our nearest non-living ancestors were crystals. The idea may be traced at least to the Russian biochemist Oparin, and to the English scholar Joseph Needham. But the first, but the first detailed formulation of the idea, acceptable to contemporary biology, is due to A.G. Cairns Smith. And the, for the paper in which you can find this described, see the beginning of organic evolution in study of time four. And also see my review paper, which is also the founder's lecture that year, Time and the Origin of Life. Let me now sum up this view of biogenesis with brutal brevity. Convincing reasons may be induced in support of the idea that some four billion years after, uh, four billion years ago, certain crystalline structures had become subject to natural selection in the rich oscillatory spectrum of the Earth, and that such selection favored systems that could maintain their growth and decay, their growth and decay processes in stable equilibrium, so as to protect them from the internal and external perturbations. Such systems could display self-directed purposes in terms of their needs and hence could provide distinctions between future and past with respect to the now. Here the now is defined by the instant-to-instant -instant maintenance of balancing their equilibrium, keeping their equilibrium in their balance. Organic intentionality was then favored because it helped satisfy the needs of the system by making it possible for it to provide for contingencies beyond the present instant. Whatever the manner in which organic intentionality as a form of causation was born, it did not replace probabilistic and deterministic causation, but was added to them as a third type of constraint upon pure becoming. During the eons between about 2 million and years and 450,000 years ago, a fourth constraint emerged, one that is unique to the human mind. Now, mind is a noun, and hence it suggests an object in space. Instead of implying the existence of such an object, I prefer to think of minding. The word minding is traceable to the 10th century when it pertained to remembering, thinking, attending, intending. <clears throat> One must have a human brain to do minding, but it is no more necessary to have a body part called mind for remembering or intending than a body part named quilt for quilting or wink for winking. I would like to represent the constraints unique to the mind.
commanding by a line from Troilus and Cressida. This is the monstrosity in love, lady, that the will is infinite and the execution confined, that the desire is boundless and the act slave to limit. The causation appropriate to minding is noetic intentionality. Through the symbolic transformation of experience, noetic intentionality expands the temporal horizons of organic intentionality. It makes it possible for humans to perceive the world and themselves in it, in terms of open-ended futures and pasts. The nested hierarchical organization of nature still holds, of course. There may be no noetic intentionality without the presence of organic intentionality, deterministic causation, probabilistic causation, and pure becoming. Let us take one more step in the evolution of causation and recognize collective intentionality. This form of causation serves the needs the hunger of human groups. It functions through religious, political, <coughs> and cultural uh, means. As one would expect, uh, there can be no collective intentionality without the presence of, as I already listed them, the ancestral forms of causation. In his space, time, and space time, Lawrence Sclare, a resident of this area, I believe, distinguished philosopher of science, judged doubtful the whole point of searching for a physical theory of time different in detail from a causal theory of time. The hierarchical theory of time shares and employs this view specifically by recognizing a nested hierarchy of qualitatively different causations, as I just recorded, uh, it identifies a nested hierarchy of qualitatively distinct temporalities. Let me describe these temporalities, starting from the top. The time of collective intentionality is socio-temporality. It is the way a culture experiences things and represents time. It is created through the dialectic between consensus and dissent pertaining to events that secure or demolish the identity of the group. It concerns social futures and pasts with respect to a collectively created and maintained social present. That's what we're working on as far as the law goes at the moment. The time of noetic intentionality is no temporality. The temporal world of mature humans in historical times. Within its horizons, a person may establish his or her ex uh, expectations and memories with reference to a mental present. The mental present, the phenomenal expression, uh, I'm sorry, the mental present is the phenomenal expression of the population dynamics of the neurons of the human brain. Uh, as the dynamics is understood in the theory of neural Darwinism proposed and developed by Gerald Edelman, also in California. The time of organic intentionality is biotemporality, the temporal reality of all the forms of, of, of uh, biotemporality, the temporality of all light forms. Its horizons compared with those of no temporality, are limited. Its reference to, uh, to an anchor is the organic present, which is created and maintained through the synchronized oscillatory processes of living organisms. The time of the world of deterministic causation is no temporality, the time of the physicist's peak. The time of the world of particle waves is prototemporality, the time of quantum physics. It is useful to stress that what is novel in what I just presented 
uh, and set about the different temporalities and different causations as constraints is uh, it is the broad aspect of that what this view offers. Uh, considered separately, the different causations and temporalities have been recognized but not as part of a rich and vast system. As an example, standing parse pro toto, let me quote from a 1966 paper on time and quantum theory by Zimmerman, a quantum physicist. Continuous and directed time, he wrote, with its well-defined instance, if needed as a reference in quantum theory, must be imported into quantum theory from the macroscopic world. Time which appears in the equations of quantum theory is not a quantum mechanical observ uh, uh, obs uh, ob observable, but a parameter external to the microscopic system. It does not refer to something internal to the quantum system, but to something measured by a laboratory device, such as a clock on the wall. In what Zimmerman asserts, the hierarchical theory of time identifies the simultaneous presence of qualitatively different temporalities, specifically prototemporality for quantum physics, prototemporality for quantum physics, eotemporality for the clock on the wall, bio, no, and sociotemporality for the experimenter. Having considered the temporalities of society, man, and uh, life, matter, and particle waves, let me turn to the time of absolute chaos or pure becoming. That word is atemporal. This term does not signify the theological timelessness of God or of anything else, nor does atemporality signify human ecstasy, often and uncritically described as that of timelessness. Rather, it signifies conditions to which none of our notions pertaining to time apply. Next, let me collect the different causations as constraints. They are absolute chaos of pure becoming and the foundations of the universe, probabilistic causation, deterministic causation, organic intentionality, noetic intentionality, collective intentionality. These are the canonical forms of causation with each causation determining a distinct canonical form of time. The term canonical, I borrowed from mathematics. It signifies the simplest form of causation and death constraints, to which uh, more, all more complex forms of causation as constraints may be reduced without losing their level specific qualities. I postulated earlier that absolute chaos or pure becoming remained a permanent substratum of the universe. What we learned about the canonical forms of causations and time supports that postulate. Namely, none of the new emerging forms of causation replaced its earlier simpler forms of form or forms. Rather, each was added to those earlier forms. It is reasonable, therefore, to maintain that the primeval, primeval world of pure becoming or absolute chaos was not replaced by later forms of causation, but remained present in all processes uh, that came about later. I also suggested that the intemporal chaos is the primeval, primeval pool of potentialities that it is the source of becoming, or the emergence of the unpredictably new, of whatever we may describe as creative, as I already said, whether or not is desirable. Therefore, let me turn to issues of the emergence of the unpredictably new in nature and man. This gets us to section two called creativeness in nature and man. To trace the path from the ever-present pure becoming or absolute chaos to the foundations of the cosmos to creativeness in nature and man we start with a critique of a broadly held belief about 
the thermodynamics of time. Arthur Stanley Eddington, distinguished physical cosmologist, was convinced that anything as important as time's passage must necessarily derive from and must be explicable in terms of physical processes. In a 1927 lecture entitled The Running Down of the Universe, he remarked that the direction of time quote, makes no appearance in physical sciences except in the study of, organi of organization of a number of individuals, unquote. He, he added the term, he coined the term, no, he added that randomness is the only thing that cannot be undone. This statistical irreversibility reminded him the irreversibility of time. In turn, uh, the singularities uh, made him remark that to find the roots of our experience of passage, we should explore the, quote, increase of the random elements in the physical world. He coined the term time's arrow, often used but seldom credited to its, uh, to its uh, creator. He used the term time's arrow to describe the one-way property of increasing randomness. The increase in randomness, he added, is quote, vividly recognized by consciousness. Eddington's model of time's arrow has been responsible for 80 years of extensive work built on the dogmatic belief that time's passage is a human recognition of the thermodynamic running down of the universe, of the increase in the entropy of the cosmos. I propose to cast a very critical eye upon this claim and recommend a way of repairing it. The increase of entropy to, what, uh, to, what, uh, to which Eddington appeals is predicated on the second law of thermodynamics. That law of nature asserts that entropy of a thermodynamically closed system uh, in the long run may only increase or remain constant but cannot decrease. This is true enough, but deriving the passage of time from an application of the second law to the cosmos has profound problems which make its validity uncertain and more importantly, the reasoning has a fatal mistake. The profound problem is that it is not at all certain that the second law of thermodynamics holds for the universe at large for the following reasons. First, it is not at all certain that the universe may be regarded as thermodynamically closed. It, namely, a closed system must have something external to it, something to which it could be open or closed. But by definition, there is nothing external to the universe. Second problem, entropy is a mathematical measure of the disorganization of a system. It needs a reference level of organization. Was there an incredible degree of orderliness in the Big Bang, one that will need billions of years to get disorganized? No. The universe is believed to have or originated from, as I stressed, some absolute, not from some absolute order, but from some absolute chaos. Uh, third item, problem with the uh, uh, closeness of the uh, application of thermodynamics, uh, the second law of thermodynamics to the universe. The cosmologist Edward Harrison, former member of the society, has given convincing reasons in support of the idea that the total entropy content of the universe remains constant. Let me assume that in spite of these serious doubts, the universe may be assumed to be thermodynamically closed and attend to what I call uh, what I regard as a fatal mistake in the reasoning that leads to the suggestion that the experience of passage of, as experience of passage is a recognition of the increasing disorder in the universe. Consider that the formulators of questions about time and thermodynamics of the universe 
are living organisms ourselves. As such, we systematically and steadily self-organize. Uh, until the day we die, our bodies propose the cosmic running plan. The direction of entropy decreases due to self-organization, self-organizing processes of our bodies, points along time's experiential arrow, just as does the direction of cosmic entropy increase. Obviously, deciding to attribute the experience of time, uh, time's passage to a steady statistical increase of cosmic disorder, increase of entropy, uh, uh, or else to a steady statistical increase of local living order, decrease of entropy, is an arbitrary, cho arbitrary choice. Both uh, selections are valid, they cure preference. I dare speculate that if Eddington had been a biologist, he would have asserted, with conviction and authority, that for the sources of our sense of passive time, we must look to the capacity of living systems to self-organize. Eddington, the biologist, would have insisted that for the roots of our experience of passage, we must look to biological processes that decrease entropy. Since the experiential direction of time may be attached with equal justification to the entropy increase of, physical, of the physical cosmos, no less than to the local entropy decrease of the life processes, it cannot be identified with either. Rather, I propose that time's experience passage relates to the opposition between entropy increasing and de decreasing processes. It relates to the fact that they define each other. Uh, it refers to the conflict it reflects the conflict between growth and decay. The temporalities of the physical world, the older undirected temporalities, permit the emergence of directed temporalities, but they do not demand direction for their own completeness. The demonstration the, uh, uh, to demonstrate to demonstrate that the two opposing arrows are co-present in the directed temporalities, I will appeal to what is what in natural sciences uh, is known as the minimal principles. Namely, for physical, chemical, and biological processes, it can often be shown that from among all processes that could take place, from among the processes allowed by the laws of nature, the processes that actually do occur are those for which uh, some characteristic variable assumes a minimal, actually minimal value. An example directly applicable to our theme is the principle of minimal entropy production for, formulated by Ilya Prigojin. It states that when a system is in, status, in a steady state, the rate of entropy increase is a minimum. I interpret this minimizing process as the superposition of the simultaneous opposing trends, the general increase in disorder and the local increase in order. Let me restate this interpretation in a form that will make it e easier to illustrate it. Although the long-term fate of the universe may well be governed by the second law of thermodynamics, the final state predicted is reached along paths governed by principles that minimize the rate of entropy production. To illustrate this grand policy, I will proceed to identify the specific oppositions between ordering and disordering associated with each form of causation as conflict, as traced uh, in the first part of my paper. Then I will give reasons why the conflicts so identified should be regarded as constitutive of the temporalities of matter, life, and society. We begin with socio-temporality, the time of human society, and work our way toward absolute chaos. 
maybe that's what's happening in the world anyhow. <laughs> that society is usually thought of as a community of individuals working toward a shared goal. But this is only half of the story. The complete story involves the instant-by-instant instant balancing of the conflicts between conduct, conduct and support, between conduct that supports and conduct that opposes whatever that goal may be. The instant-by-instant instant coordination of the opposing trends defines, creates the social present. It is with respect to the social present that collective memories about history and collective intentions may acquire meaning. Such conflicts are constitutive of society because if they create, if they cease, the persons may well be around, but society will have collapsed into anarchy. That's part of my experience as a growing uh, boy. A group of people in anarchy cannot create, much less maintain the social present. In the absence of the social present, no meaning may be assigned either to history or to planning and hence to socio-temporality. From the constitutive conflicts of society, let me turn to the conflicts that are constitutive, constitutive of personhood. A person or individual is a member of our species possessing stable identity, that is, stable biological and psychological functions, unique to the species. That stability is created and maintained by a steady balancing of conflicts between the processes that support and the social, mental and biological perturbations that oppose the instant-by-instant instant balancing act defines the mental present. It is with respect to the mental present that noetic intentionality or goal-directedness and the noetic memories may acquire meaning. In the absence of noetic time, uh, in, in their absence, noetic time cannot acquire direction. The conflicts implied are constitutive of personhood, personal identity, and with it of no temporality, because if they cease, as they do, for instance, in senility, a man or woman may well remain alive, but his or her personal identity becomes ill-defined or vanishes. He or she becomes, quote, of course, a walking shadow, a tale told by, idiot, by an idiot, full of sand and fury, signifying nothing, unquote. Lady Macbeth, after the evil day, ceased to be, ceased to live in no temporal reality. Turning out to the moon one step down, the life process is usually thought of as a, as one of growth through self-organization. But that is only half of the story, because, another quote, from hour to hour we write and write, and from hour to hour we rot and rot, rot and thereby hangs to tail. End of the book. Recognizing, uh, ripening and rotting are jointly constitutive of life and hence of biotemporality because if either growth or decay ceases, and uh, they cease their dialectic, uh, their dialectic ceases, as does life, and with it, organic intentionality and biotemporality vanish. Conflicts between growth and decay are also constitutive of uh, ponderable inanimate matter in a very grand style, of course. The entropy increase of the cosmos is opposed by the creation of order brought about by its cooling. But the two trends are not and in fact cannot be coordinated in the cosmic present because as we know from relativity theory, uh, there is no worldwide simultaneity and hence no universal common time. Presentness or nowness have only local meaning. We arrived at the dot universe, the very small, very hot universe. Good reasons may be given in support of the view 
that the creative uh, that the creative conditions that emerged from the primeval chaos were not those of order but those of conflict between different forms of ordering and disordering as later constitute uh, constituted conflict uh, of inanimate, inanimate matter of life and mining and society may be seen as stages in the evolution of the, that primeval opposition. Uh, as this point of our, at this point of our survey, a remarkable policy of nature comes into view. It pertains to the conflicts between ordering and disordering. Let me identify its steps. The most primitive ordering opposition to the running down of the universe is the gathering of, gathering of particle waves governed by probabilistic laws. The next level of self-organization, then by solid matter, is governed by the deterministic laws uh, that are steps uh, in increasing efficiency from probability to certainty. But even the most efficient deterministic self-organization of uh, inanimate matter can do no more than decrease the rate of disorganization, the rate of entropy increase. Life can do better. It can do so by connecting cause and effect through organic intentionality, specifically for small regions confined excuse me, within a living body, it can actively, purposefully reverse decay by self-directed growth. That active opposition, in the uh, opposition to decay by life, becomes more effective to processes whose events are connected by noetic intentionality, and that become even, and it can become even more so in the world of collective intentionality. We observe a generalized natural selection identified in the evolution of the means that oppose an increase in cosmic disordering. It is a grand process, an immense journey along steps of constitutive conflict between increasingly more complex forms of ripening and rotting. And maybe we'll say something about complexity later. This gets me to the conclusion of the paper, section called Human Values. Constraints, as understood in this paper, may be divided into two distinct categories. The laws of nature is one, one category, human values is the other. I submit that there is a nested hierarchical relationship between the two. There is a continuity between them. Also, while upon a superficial view, both categories of constraints appear to favor permanence, upon closer examination, they both turn out to be agents of change. Human values are generalizations arrived by inductive reasoning. They express in collectively intelligible forms what appears to be useful constraints upon belief, conduct, and emotion. Uh, since Greek antiquity, they have been classed under the ideas of the true, the good, and the beautiful. I will define each term, each in terms of its relation to time. But first, I want to explain that by constraints being useful, is meant that they assist in maintaining the peculiarly human conflicts concerning beliefs, conduct, and emotions. These conflicts must be maintained because for reasons to be given, if they cease their dialectic, if they cease their dialectic, then our value judgments vanish, and with them vanish our hallmarks as humans. As our human values, the laws of nature are also generalizations established by inductive reasoning. We express in collectively acceptable forms what appears to be unchanging and for that reason easily quantifiable relationships. That there appears 
to the, that uh, there appears to be a grand natural process which favors increasing efficiency in opposing decay is prima facie evidence that the laws of nature are agents of change. Probabilistic causation, causation was but a necessary step toward the emergence of deterministic causation. It was then probabilistic and the deterministic causation together that made possible the emergence of organic intentionality. It is the nested hierarchical relationship of probabilistic and the deterministic constraints upon the atemporal ideas that provide the continuity from the laws of nature to life, to money, and hence to the constraints known as human values. But as we leave the physical integrative levels for those of life, mind, and society, the, comp the uh, complexity of processes and structures increases by many orders of magnitude. In fact, numbers may be generated and put into uh, 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 offer as support in, in support of this statement. Uh, quantitative uh, methods remain important but they tend to become inadequate for exploring the constraints and formulating guidelines for the life, men mental and social processes of humans. Whatever regulations seem to be relevant become increasingly qualitative in, in their nature. It is the distinctions between the quantitative and qualitative cross quantitative constraints that distinguishes the laws of nature from human values. Let me now turn uh, to the working details of the broad claims I just made. First, I will propose working definitions of the true, the good, and the beautiful in terms of their relation to time. Then, in conclusion, I will explore their roles as constraints that bring about changes in beliefs, conduct, and emotions. Truth as a human value may be defined as the recognition of permanence in reality. That good as a human value be defined as an assertion that certain conduct, intent, or character traits will promote stable harmony in the minds and the affairs of persons and societies. Finally, that beauty as a human value be defined as a quality of an object or event that engenders feelings which are which one would like to perpetuate. And growing these definitions, we may now explore the long-term roles of human values. First, truth as a human value. Although searching for truth is driven by the desire for identifying permanence in man and nature, the historical function of seeking truth has been the creation of conflicts, which in their turn create changes in the very processes that generate them. The working definition of good appeals to the desire to, stable, to stabil stability and harmony in human effect, effect. This goal is sometimes achieved in the short term, but the long-term office of good has been the opposite, as I see. Moral judgments have been creating and maintaining conflicts concerning conduct and intent, and through them have been keeping alive a steady revolt against whatever principles happen to be guiding people's conduct and intent. I believe that the incredible creativeness, as well as the uh, uh, immense destructiveness of our species, are not are due not not to concern, are due to not having and following more uh, moral principles, but having and following them. The working definition of the beautiful related it to the desire to identify feelings which one would wish to perpetuate. Yet the evolutionary office of aesthetic faculties, of the aesthetic faculties, 
has been that of generating and maintaining conflicts between the world as we find it to be and that other world of imagination to which art gives transient forms and changing names. Let me summarize what was said about human values as constraints. It was this, it was this. We share with the laws of nature the qualities of promoting local ordering that opposes cosmic disordering. This would suggest that human values promote conservative trends, which they indeed do for the short run, but for the long run, they promote change by creating new and more complex conflicts between local representations of the cosmic features of growth and decay, recognized in the words of the Bible as ripening and rough. Uh, with an, with uh, an idea uh, of the laws of nature and of human values as agents of changes together, together with the idea of constitutive conflicts of matter, life and society, we are ready to turn to the issue of human time as something immensely more intricate than the recognition of increasing entropy in the universe. And this is the conclusion of the paper. Human time. As humans, we are members of human societies. As a part of our tasks, we practice minding, or at least try to. To be able to do so, we must be alive. To be alive must be, must be made of matter in its particle form, while also depending on the functions of particle waves. We are even in contact with absolute chaos of pure becoming of the dot universe, that Chaucer well knew when he wrote that it is good to keep one's poise and be protected, since all day long you may meet the unexpected. Unquote. In other words, you are part of all integrated levels uh, of nature. It follows that at the causation as constraints, that follows that all constraints and constraints that I have identified, uh, and everything I said about time, all the conflicts between ripening and rotting, may be identified among the features of human time. So are all the laws of nature. Also, we are constrained by the family of human values, serving as agents of change. Positions as we are at the complexity boundary of the universe, we are subject to natural selection that favors increased efficiency in opposing cosmic entropy increase. To keep ourselves alive and our minds functioning, we continuously balance or try to balance uncountably many constraints. Our situation makes King Lear's concern concerns a concern of our species. Quote, oh, let me not be mad, not mad, sweet heaven, keep in tender, I would not be mad. I believe that our unique species-specific state is that of madness, both the controlled and uncontrolled type. That is, a condition responsible for the immense creativity and destructiveness of men and women. Therefore, the question arises, how to manage the constraints upon being human? I think my view from all thinkers, East and West, who emphasized the importance of recognizing the unity of things. If so, then our program should be to willingly share the dynamics of all constraints and constitutive conflicts of matter, life, mind, and society. Where may we find instructions on how to proceed? In the literary, literary arts, I selected a poem by uh, Yeats called Those Images because it maps into uh, concise poetic language what the theory of Alice Hawking says about constraints, about nature, 
and about human values. And here is the quote. Seek those images that constitute the wild, the lion and the virgin, the barrel and the child. Find the middle there, an eagle on the wing. Recognize the fire that made the muses sing. Thank you. Thank you.